So we want to introduce the Dito integral and to study its basic uh, properties before considering the Ito the blink formula and then immediately applying the Ito integral to the rest of our course over and over again. Now, the idea is that we start from a probability space, omega and v. This triplet contains three elements, the state space omega, f, the sigma algebra, and p, the probability measure on the measurable space, uh, omega, f. Since in finance we take our decisions most of the time over a fixed time horizon, so when I'm making my investment decision uh, and I'm buying an asset, I say, okay, I want this asset, I want to hold this asset in my portfolio, or I want to uh, build a strategy that has a time horizon of two days, one year, 10 years, 50 years, whatever, but there is a time horizon. So what we will also consider is a time horizon, the so-called horizon of events, zero capital P, with the understanding that zero is today, and capital P is what we will call the maturity of the, of the investment. Now we have this uh, triplet, the probability space, we have this, and we assume that we have one emotion, D, T, omega, defined on the probability space. Now in my notation, you will see that sometimes I use omega, sometimes I don't use the omega. Now, omega is something that I put in a, in a function to specify that it's a random object. Now, for the one motion, by definition, it's a random object, so if you want, it's a little bit redundant, but initially, let's try to be formal, then immediately after, I mean, in a few minutes, I will remove that in order to simplify notation. But recall that every time that you see omega here means that omega in capital omega uh, is just a realization of the, our random process. And if you see a function that it has in and its argument omega, then this is not a deterministic function, but a random function. Okay, so we have this Brownian motion. What we want to be able to evaluate is then an object of this type. The integral zero capital T of what? The integral zero capital T of a function f t omega and look omega, so possibly f is a random function, d b t omega. So, this is what I will call Ito integral, and this is the object that I want to define and I want to study. Now, little spoiler. First of all, we will see that not all f can be used in an Ito integral. The function f needs, or the process f, needs to satisfy a certain number of assumptions, a certain number of properties, and we will see needs to belong to special classes of functions. In this course, we will consider two of them. There are a few more, but we will just consider what is enough for us for the modeling of our problems. Second spoiler, if you want, in a sense, this object here is defined mimicking what happens in the Riemann stitches approach. So, allow me to introduce a partition T0 Pn of the interval 0 capital T such that 0 is equal to T0, which is more 
the T1, which is smaller than all the others, up to Tn, which is the last point, which is equal to capital T. And an important assumption that we would make and that would prove essential later, for example, for exploiting properties of the bone in motion like the quadratic correlation, we assume the mesh of this partition to vanish with N. What does it mean? It means that if I consider the mesh of the partition, so the maximum over uh, K of Tk plus 1 minus Tk, this quantity goes to 0 for N tending to infinity. Obviously, K goes from 0 to so we are assuming this condition, so the, the mesh vanishes. If we assume this, then what I can do is the following. I can define this, and this is a spoiler. We will reach that result uh, in different steps. But the spoiler is that I can define this integral here as the limit for n tending to infinity of what? Of the sum for j from 0 to n minus 1 of f tk, uh, f tj, sorry, f tj omega, and then the corresponding increment of the Brownian motion, that is to say, b tj plus 1 omega, minus b t j omega. Okay? This would be our definition of the Ito integral. Now, as I was telling you a moment ago, in order to define this integral, the first thing that we have to do is to define what type of functions f can be used in order to probably play with an integral that we will call Ito integral. So let's see the first class of function that goes under the name of M2 class. Definition. F which is a function that maps from 0 plus infinity. Also here, I will often skip plus in writing infinity. I will write explicitly minus infinity, but if I just write plus infinity, it means plus infinity. So f maps from 0 infinity omega into R and F belongs to the M two zero T class if and zero T is a little bit redundant. You can say just M two, but just to be a little bit pedantic at the moment and to be picky we call it the m to 0 t because we are restricting our attention on the 0 t time interval the m to 0 t class so in principle what happens outside of that is not our problem what is important is that the properties that i'm not going to least hold in 0 t out of that who cares so this function is in the m to 0 t class if it satisfies essentially three properties. Now, the first one is fundamental, it's important, but it's nothing particularly difficult to understand. It's just a matter of saying that we are prosaically able to do things mathematically, that we have all the information, all the things that are needed to evaluate this type of function. In other words, we assume that f t omega is uh, 
B times F measurable. Where B is the Borel sigma algebra B on R zero infinity and F is the sigma algebra from the probability space we are starting with, so omega F B. What is the Borel sigma algebra? You remember from your previous courses. If you don't, again, on Bright Space, you find a little bit of extra information and resources to refresh your knowledge of algebras, sigma algebras, the Borel sigma algebra, and so on. The Borel sigma algebra is the smallest sigma algebra that contains all the intervals that can be defined as open, closed, semi open, and blah, 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 intervals of R. Rn, in this case, R0 infinity, because we are considering the non-negative semi-line. Given that, for us, this non-negative semi-line represents time. But please, if you do not recall what the Borel sigma algebra is, please check. So we are assuming this measurability condition, fine. The second, it's still a measurability condition, but it's a little bit different. We are assuming that f t omega is f t measurable. Where f t comes from f t t in zero capital T. Which is what is the natural filtration generated by the Brownian motion that we are considering. It means that Ft at time t is the sigma algebra generated by the Brownian motion uh, B that we can represent as BU such that U is more than equal to T. Okay? So this is our element of the filtration. Obviously, this filtration is included in the sigma algebra of the space. Now, what does it mean that Ft omega is Ft measurable? It means that Ft is adapted to the filtration in T. And it means that it's non-anticipated. This is very important. Write it down. Financially speaking, it is non-anticipated. What does I what do I mean? I mean that if I want to evaluate f t omega, so if I want to evaluate my function f at time t, all I need to know in order to be able to evaluate that function is contained in the filtration stopped in t. So the evaluation of my function does not require to know what will happen in the future. If I want to evaluate the returns of an asset, if I want to evaluate the price of an asset, if I want to evaluate a strategy, if I want to hedge a strategy, all I need to know is what happened before and until now, not what will happen tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So I don't need the future in order to evaluate my strategy. This is important. And we will see that this simplifies a lot the treatment. We will immediately exploit this uh, property in the Ito integral. And it tells us that, in a sense, what we observed in the past helps us in evaluating all our quantities and in making inference about that. Please notice that when I say what we observed in the past, I'm not saying that we just rely on what really happened in the past. This is not the point. Statistically speaking, that would be an error because it's historical bias. What I'm saying is that what we observe in the past and what we can infer from the past is what we need in order to evaluate our function at time t. So what happened between zero and small t is enough to evaluate our function in t. I don't need 
to know what will happen in t plus 1, t plus 2, t plus 3, until capital T. Now, these things, from a certain point of view, make sense. It simplifies a lot of things mathematically, but it also has some implications in terms of philosophical uh, treatment of probability. I will be more clear in the rest of the course later when we have enough knowledge of the basic tools. But what I can already say, if you want a sort of spoiler, is that this view, while totally meaningful, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I mean, in this setting, it's totally meaningful, is also a little bit over line on what happened in the past. And in terms of our definition of probability is it's implicitly assuming that we are somehow objectivists and that we have a certain understanding of risk and uncertainty. Now, in my other course, Quantitative Risk Management, I go much deeper in these topics. But you, if you want, are a little bit epistemological, but very important to understand if you want to be a good risk manager. But also in our course, I will go Deeper. So for the moment, we accept this without questioning too much. It makes sense because I want to be able to make inference and understanding what is happening in my function at t with information I have up to, up to time t. But this view can be changed. Obviously, if you change this, you're also changing the rest. So we have to be careful. The third condition, if you want, the third condition uh, for our function f to be in the uh, M2 class is an integrability condition. So we are essentially requiring that the expected value of the integral between 0 and capital T of f t omega dt squared is finite. So this is simply an integrability condition. We are assuming that the expectation, why the expectation? Because recall that this guy here is a random quantity. So if it is deterministic, essentially, you, you don't really need the expectation. But if it is random, and in general it is random, you need the expectation. We are assuming the, the expectation of f squared between zero and capital T is finite. Now, can you see what is the rationale behind this type of assumption? Remember that this is the random quantity that we want to integrate within the Ito integral. This assumption essentially tells us that we will not play with fat tails. So you know that fat tails are my field of research, risk, and extreme risk are my field of research. But the fact that we are assuming this condition essentially is ruling out fat tails. We want to play with objects for which the mean and the variance are always defined. So we do not want to consider situations in which, for example, the variance is not finite, is infinite, or not defined. You will never consider a situation in which the mean is not finite, yet there are fields, if you want a risk management in which, in principle, you can think of an infinite mean and blah, blah, blah. If you're interested, come to the QRM course. But we agree that in all the rest of finance, the mean exists. We know, we, observe, we can observe it or we can estimate it, so it's not a big deal. But for sure, the variance is a little bit trickier. So there are situations in which the variance is not, uh, is not finite. But since we want the variance to be finite, it means that if we have to approach those situations, we have to be careful. And maybe this setting is not necessarily the, the right one. Uh, we will see that when you move from the M2 class to the other class, which is a little bit general, the, a little bit more general, which is the H2 class. In the H2 class, for example, we do be on this type of, of assumptions. Okay, 
What we do now is to play with functions that are in this situation. So if you want the a little bit more trivial assumptions on measurability, an interesting property always in measurability, but in terms of non-anticipating process. So we don't need the future to evaluate the present. We need the past, but not the future. And an integrability condition that tells us that we restrict our attention to random things that in many cases have a finite mean and a finite values. Okay, that's, that's very important. From this, we can now move on and try to reach this result here. Questions? Okay, so what we want to do is to play with this e to integral. And the spoiler I gave you is that this e to integral is essentially the limit of a sum of objects. Now what we do is to follow the idea of e to. So we will start for, from functions that are actually in the M2 class, but they are simple. They are actually called simple processes or elementary functions. They are synonyms. Choose what you want. I typically say simple process, but elementary function is totally fine. So we start from these simple processes, which are a subclass of functions in the M2 class, and we find the Ito integral for those. And we study the properties of the Ito integral for those. After that, we will see, thanks to a series of results, lemmas, propositions, and theorems, that actually the Ito integral of whatever general function f in the M2 class can be obtained via the approximation of the Ito integrals for simple processes. An important result is that for every function f in the M2 class, and also later in the H2 class, there always exists a sequence of simple processes in the M2 or the H2 class that approximates that function. So we can actually play with the limit that I gave you in my spoiler of the final result. So what is a simple process? A simple process, let's write our definition, Phi in M2 zero T is a simple process or if you want a repeat elementary function if Phi T omega is equal to what? Is equal to the sum for j from 0 to n minus 1 of a j omega, the indicator of the time interval tj tj plus 1 t. Well, obviously, we are or in the same framework as before, so we know that 0 is equal to t0, smaller than t1, smaller than blah, 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 until tn, which is equal to capital T. So what we are saying is that essentially a simple process is any process that can be defined as a simple sum of random variables. Why random variables? Because immediately observe that aj has an argument omega. So aj is possibly a random quantity. And two things can be immediately inferred from that equation. The first one is that aj omega is random. I'm not saying that it cannot be deterministic that it can be a constant or whatever you want. But for sure, in the general setting, it can be random and it has to be random. And the same, the second one is that since phi is in M2, 
You recall the second properties of the empty class, so the non-anticipating property, the adaptivity process, uh, property with respect to the filtration generated by the design motion. Okay, it means that at time tj, the quantity a j omega is f t j. It's becoming a mess. So it's f t j measurable. That is extremely important. We will use that in a minute. So at time t j, the quantity a j omega is f t j measurable. So at time tj, we have all we need to know in order to evaluate that. So what is a simple process? A simple process then, graphically speaking, is a very simple object. So here we have t, time t. Assume that this is time 0 equal to 0. Here we have time 1. Here we have time 2. And here we have time 3. Then blah, 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 until capital T which is also equal to Tn, okay? So our process is essentially defined in the following way. There will be a realization of Aj in T0, so time 0. Let's say that this is the realization. And then we go like this. Then maybe it jumps. Let's say that it jumps here. And we go like this. Then maybe it jumps again, it goes like this, and when we are at the end, it will reach, say that we are in T minus 1, it will be like somewhere here, or here, or here. So we are just collecting these random variables. This is what a simple process is. Now, once we have a simple process, we can define the Ito integral for simple processes. And this is a definition. And it's the building block of all the results that we will get today and next time. Here's the problem. Let phi in M2 0 capital T be a simple process. Then it's e to integral is given by the following. Zero capital T phi T omega D B T omega is equal to what? Is equal to the sum for J from zero to N minus one of A J omega, the increment of the corresponding time interval. That is to say B T j plus 1 omega minus b t j omega. If you want, you can already simplify the notation by writing b t j plus 1 minus b t j because we know that obviously this is the Brownian motion. So the omega is a little bit redundant. So this is the definition of Ito integral for simple processes. The top function in M2 that, that can be represented as the sum of random variables. Okay? The first thing that we can do once we have this definition is to study a little bit the properties of this integral. So we can study the basic properties of the Ito integral for simple processes. The first properties that we consider are four 
And of these four properties, I will leave the proof of the first two to you because it's very simple. So it's just a matter of substitution. I will focus more on the second two properties because they are also more interesting from a probabilistic point of view.